much for coming tonight, and um, thank you, Noreen, for hosting us. Very happy to be here. I'm going to read um, from the uh, very beginning of the new novel, Inside, and this is uh, set in Montreal in 1996. At first glance, she mistook him for something else. In the fading winter light, he could have been a branch or a log, even a tire. In the many years she'd been cross-country skiing on Mount Royal, she'd found stranger debris across her path. People left behind their scarves, their shoes, their inhibitions. She'd come across lovers naked to the sky, even on cold days. In spite of these distractions, the mountain was the one place where she felt at peace, especially in winter, when tree branches stretched empty of leaves and she could see the city below her. Its clusters of green spired churches and gray skyscrapers laid out, graspable. Streets rolling down to the old port, and in either direction the bridges extending over the pale water of the St. Lawrence. This winter had been mild, and what snow did fall first melted, then turned to ice overnight. Now, at the end of January, it had finally snowed all night and all day, at last enough to ski on. Luckily, her final appointment that afternoon had canceled, leaving her free to drive up before the light was gone. She slipped around the chalet and headed into the woods, losing the vista of Montreal below, gaining muffled silence and solitude, the trees turning the light even fainter. One skier had been here before her, leaving a path of parallel stripes. On a slight downhill slope, she crouched down and picked up speed as she moved around a bend. Turning, she saw the branch, or whatever it was, too late. Though she tried to slow down, she wasn't quick enough and ran right into it and was knocked out of her skis, falling sideways into the snow, realizing only when she sat up that what had tripped her was the body of a man. Her legs were on top of his, her right knee throbbing from the impact. The air torn from her returned slowly, painfully, to her burning lungs. When she could breathe, she said, are you all right? There was no answer. He was flung across the trail with his head half buried in the snow. Beyond his body, the ski marks stopped. She thought he must have had an accident, but then she saw his skis propped neatly against a tree. She got to her feet and gingerly stepped around until she could see his face. He wasn't wearing a hat. Excuse me, she said, louder. Are you okay? She thought maybe he'd collapsed after a heart attack or stroke. He lay sprawled on his side, knees bent, eyes closed, one arm up above his head. Monsieur, she said. Ça va? Kneeling down to check his pulse, she saw the rope around his neck. Thick and braided, it trailed beneath him, almost nestled under his arm, and the other end rested in a snowbank. No, was buried underneath it and on the other side, she could see that the branch it had been tied to had broken off. She hurriedly loosened the rope and found the beating rhythm in his neck, then opened the first few snaps of his coat in the hope that this might help him to breathe. His face wasn't blue. He was around her age, thirties, his short, wavy brown hair riddled with gray. Still, his eyes wouldn't open. Should she slap him? Administer CPR? She pushed him gently onto his back. Monsieur, she said again. He didn't move. She skied quickly back to the chalet and called 911. In her halting French, all the more fractured because she was out of breath, she tried to describe where in the woods they were. When she returned, he was lying where she'd found him. Sir, she said, my name is Grace. Je m'appelle Grace. I called for help. Everything will be all right. Vous êtes sauvé. She put her ear next to his mouth to hear his breath. His eyes were still closed, but he heavily, unmistakably, sighed. Later, at the Montreal General, she realized that both pairs of skis had been left behind. The emergency workers had loaded the man into the ambulance, and she had followed it, weaving through the traffic along Côte des Neiges. She wasn't even sure why. Because the urgent santé men had looked at her expectantly, assuming she and the man had been skiing together? Because one of them had said in commingled English and French, the police, 
Nous allons vous poser des questions à l'hôpital. Et elle a nodé obediently, comme une school girl. It was partly curiosity to know what had driven him to such an act, and partly pity, because anyone driven to hang himself would have to be suffering deeply and terribly. And it was partly that she, of all people, had been the one to throw herself across his path. Or maybe it was just because she wanted to know what had happened. Regardless, she was sitting in the waiting room hours later, shivering each time the glass doors slid open with an icy draft. The linoleum was streaked with gray-brown slush people had tracked in, and she could smell car exhaust and cigarette smoke from the sidewalk outside. There was no sign of any police officer wanting to ask her questions. The man had been wheeled off with a canopy of nurses over his still silent body. Grace waited, though she wasn't sure for what or whom. When she remembered the skis, probably long gone by now, she smacked herself on the forehead. Hers were practically brand new. She looked at her watch. It was seven o'clock and completely dark on the mountain. She was tired and hungry and ready to go home. Before she did, though, she wanted to know that he was being taken care of. She walked over to a nurse at the reception area. Excuse me, she said. Can I see him? The nurse didn't look up from her paperwork. Qui, madame? The man who was brought in earlier, the skier. Who? I don't know his name. He was found on the mountain. I don't know his name. I found him up there. So you aren't family. Her tone was hostile, weary. I'm a therapist, Grace said suddenly. Un psychologue. The nurse nodded, her manner softening at the French. Now she seemed to grant her a professional capacity, and Grace didn't disabuse her. I must see him as soon as possible, she said, trying to sound authoritative. The nurse hesitated for a moment, then shrugged and pointed to the elevator. 316, she said. Grace knocked before entering. The man was lying on his back wearing a hospital gown, an IV drip attached to his arm. He was staring at the ceiling with a blank expression that didn't change when she came in. Whatever pain he'd been feeling on the mountain was absent from his face now. He might have been waiting for a train. Visible around his neck was the thick red abrasion from the rope. Clearing her throat, she sat down in a chair next to the bed. Do you speak English, she said. No answer. You parlez français? Again, nothing. I took a little Spanish in high school, but that's all gone, so these are pretty much your only options, she said. His clothes were folded and stacked on a bedside table. I'm going to look through your things for your name unless you specifically tell me not to. She went through the clothes, feeling for a wallet, and he made no move to stop her, even when she found it and pulled out his license. John Tugwell. English, after all. She put everything back as it had been and sat down again. John, my name is Grace, she said, and I'm a therapist, though that's not why I'm here. I was just skiing when I found you lying on the ground. The branch you tied yourself to broke off. I called the ambulance. But for a blink, he made no sign of being conscious. She couldn't even tell if he was listening. His hands, palm down above the blanket, lay flat, unclenched. There usually aren't many people in that part of the park, she said, which I guess must be why you chose it. I don't know what would have happened if I hadn't come along. Do you have tried again after a while? He said nothing. There were deep lines around his eyes as if he spent a lot of time outdoors. His lips were unnaturally pale. Beneath the thin hospital blanket, his body looked sturdy and solidly muscled. It was impossible to tell, as he lay there, whether he was handsome or not. The spirit that would have animated his face, giving it character and attitude, had receded from view. She stepped closer. Even at this little distance, his body seemed to give off no heat whatsoever, as if he'd been permanently chilled. You're back from the dead, she said. Maybe you don't want to be, but you are. For the first time, his eyes met hers. They were green. Then he blinked again and closed them. If you want to talk, Grace said, I can listen. Mm -hmm. All right, so um, I think what we'll do is back up, back way, way up, and then we'll come back around to the novel. Um, but um, 
we start at the beginning, how you met, how you became aware of Alex's work? Uh, well, we have uh, actually known each other a long time. I um, first met Gary when I was just out of college, and I actually worked for him uh, briefly at Trump for around a year and a half as his editorial assistant, which was um, really an amazing experience for me. And I think I, I always say that that was my sort of um, pre-MFA, MFA in writing, because I learned so much about um, uh, the process of editing fiction and the process of writing good fiction during that um, uh, brief time, and then I sort of threw it away and you know, decided to move to New much, Mexico, much to <laughs> and uh, then we didn't see each other for a really long time until um, I was ready with my books. I was, Alex was such a pleasure to work with, and not only from my point of view, but from the point of view of writers that we were getting published, uh, that it was heartbreaking actually when <laughs> she came to me and said, if I don't do this now, I don't know what I might do it. And I wanted to say, gosh, could you try something a little bit easier? <laughs> you know, I mean, because the odds are tough. I mean, I'm not going to anybody in this room. But Alex then disappeared for, gosh, I don't know, 10 years, 12 years, something like that. Pain due. I mean, really putting in extraordinary amount of work, which sometimes leads to something and sometimes not. Um, sometimes leads to the realization that you don't have what it takes. But when Alex Henry reappeared in my life, it was clear that she found what it takes and had taken it beyond that. Um, I published her first novel, what year was that event? 2005. 2000, longer ago, but 2005, I think we would have left in 1992-ish. Oh. Bad to hear about that. It's like when I was working. What day is it? And that was an astonishing novel. It was the first And then the collection of stories, both of which got incredible critical attention. Other writers would be sent galleys to like the books and all the rest of it. And I couldn't have been happier. Um, I wasn't surprised because Alex's intelligence and taste was pretty much obvious before around and off, at least before we met. Um, but I got to know it sort of firsthand. And, and then when these two new books came, which are nice, unusual that we're publishing simultaneously the novel and hardcover and the story collection in, in vintage is the trade paperback original. This there's a point to this, um, not just because you don't want to do two books in hardcover at one point at one time. But we I had tried two, three years ago, maybe you know, four, five, six, seven. Uh, when we had a similar circumstance with Jim Shepard, who we published several books with, and he delivered a novel and, and the beginnings of the collection of stories at the same time. And back then, whenever it was, um, Jim had a huge reputation amongst writers, with far, far smaller readership than he deserved. He said, well, why don't we see if stir something up a little bit. We do the hardcover, the novel in hardcover to novel. And we can do a new and selected story you know, with this beginning of the collection. Fill it out with, you know, in kind of refer to these great stories that he had published previously. And that it worked because people who signed book reviews, they said, well this is kind of weird. Why are we doing this? It must mean that something very special here, and, and since it did kind of work, and it got more reviews for the book, and then half sales of the books, and the subsequent book, I said, for Alex, it's kind of a no-brainer. So if you buy a lot of books, then you're pretty right. <laughs> <laughs> so, Alex, can you tell me a little bit about your relationship with Jim Shepard? Because I think that's 
between the time you left working for Gary and when you came back with books ready to go? Um, did you go to an MFA program? What did you? I, I, I did eventually go to an MFA program. I first uh, sort of started working for moment that I think a lot of young people have in New York, which is like, I'm leaving the city and going, you know, somewhere completely different. So I went to New Mexico and, uh, like, I got rid of all my stuff and got a car and drove cross country and moved to Albuquerque <laughs> for reasons that were clear only to myself at the time. And, um, you know, it's the sort of thing that you would sort of only do when you're 25. Um, so I spent a few years in New Mexico, um, you know, working on jobs over the temp. I worked at Barnes & Noble for a while. And I was just writing that whole time. I was reading a lot and writing a lot of really, really bad uh, short stories. You know, they were just terrible, and I knew they were terrible, and it was just, you know, I had had these original visions. I think when I left New York, that I would be back like in a year with my New York vision, <laughs> you know, and I was distraught to discover that that was not uh, going to happen for me. So after a few years of, of that, I finally realized that I needed more help. I needed more experience. I needed more uh, of a community. Also, I was very lonely as a writer, so I wound up going and getting my MFA uh, at the Michener Center in Austin, uh, which uh, was a great experience. It was even better than I could have hoped for, and the best part about it really was the friendships that I made with other writers, some of whom I'm happy to say are here tonight, and friendships that have lasted and been really important to me, you know, as a writer and as a person. So that was really great um, to, to have that experience, and it was after I um, graduated my MFA. I had written the first draft of The Missing Person as my um, MFA thesis, a very, very, very rough draft of it, and that eventually turned into the book that Gary published. And do you have a, do you have a first reader, or do you have or the friendships you made at the Mitchell Center? Is that still a group of people who you will let you see your work yeah. early on? Yeah, absolutely. Um, there is a uh, uh, Jenny, my friend from uh, from Austin, was one of the first readers of this novel that I read from tonight, and um, I have other friends too that um, I've met along the way who are a match in terms of sensibility and the kind of criticism that they um, that they can offer that is helpful and workable for me in terms of how to proceed. With so I know you liked Alex very much as someone to work with, but when the books came back to you, when you saw the work. What was it in particular about her writing that attracted you, or that made you feel it was right for you as an editor? Well, I think that, first of all, in a situation like that, it's, it's hard enough when you're shown work by complete stranger. And not, we had we kept up a little bit when we exchanged Christmas cards and stuff, but it's been years and years. But when you know somebody, and this includes people that writers who were already published. There's a new book, and that's always an excitement that can give way to a sort of gasping nightmare. You know, like, <laughs> that's the worst reaction you can have. I mean, you don't want to have it, but first of all, you have to be honest about something. You can't fake it. Um, nobody would believe you if you tried. So, my first reaction was, she's a hell of a writer. I mean, it's just like when I was listening to her read this. I've only heard Alex read once before, two years ago. Yeah, yeah that was hard. And, and, and I felt with the missing person, much as I felt when I read this chapter, which I never read aloud to myself, it was better to hear Alex do the thing. Um, it's, it's so engaging. It's, it's, it's a, a combination of, first of all, you have to be able to write. You have to put words together in a way that seems precise and controlled and evocative and all of that stuff. If behind those words, you can't make nothing out of nothing. There has to be character behind it. There has to be there has to be something going on. And she clearly had that, which sounds kind of like an everyday thing, except it isn't. Um, okay, I, I read a lot of stuff, and that's what I'm looking for. It's always different. So there wasn't anything, I mean, everything that's distinctive about Alex, 
work is pretty much what we heard just a few minutes ago. Um, and and she's developed. I mean, it, it's wonderful to me all the attention this first book got with these two new books. And suddenly got publishers all over Europe. I mean, and the reaction that we have, I mean, it's typical when you publish any, any, any book, you send advanced copy to other writers who possibly are better now, and you know, hopes that they're going to say something nice that we can then use to entice people who don't know Alex. And the response for both of these books and all of the story was, I don't remember anything quite like it. Um, people who had no clue who she was, probably most of them had never read her. Um, and I already knew what I thought, so I wasn't learning anything from this except how kind of broad and wide range of talent was. You know, Alex.
thought strokes editing where somebody reads the book very quickly and makes a few broad observations. This is well, you should do this, you should do that. Because that's not even equal to the, to the it's kind of insulting to the effort that the writer has already put into the, to the book. I mean, the writer has thought a lot about what's in the book and how he did it down in the book. I believe the only way to engage as an editor is on a line-by-line -line basis and to get into the DNA of the book as much as you possibly can. Because that's where you discover what the DNA of the book really is, what the, what the writer's trying to do, and wrestling with it, arguing with it, sort of saying this isn't as good as that. I mean, each book, not just this each writer, but each writer from the book book will be wrestling with different problems and all the rest of it. You wrestle alongside and try to understand better, try to suggest where something can be done better. And it's like having a long and extremely boring conversation. <laughs> it takes me an hour to do five pages. I mean, you just do the math. I mean, if it's 300 pages long, is that 80 hours or and I have all my say, I kind of write it on the page, and I send it to the writer, who then, in Alex's case, she gets her say. And if she can't read my handwriting or if she can't read the same, I say, we can talk about that. But I don't want to talk about it, unless there's something you need to talk about. <laughs> so it's, it's a mute conversation. I get to talk quietly, and then Alex gets to respond, and then party's over. So, that's the only way I can figure out how to do it. And you know, there might be cases you know, where you can say, well, this character seems so unlikable. You want that person to be so unlikable. So, boy, you've nailed it. <laughs> if you haven't attempted that, think again. So it's not all putting and taking out a comment, but it's but make a great sweeping observation like months later when you write your flat copy. Do you write your own flat copy? <laughs> <laughs>